Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I am Daryl Grove and I'm joined as ever by a man who bleeds red, white and blue. It's Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello. Mostly red, but I see what you did there. Yeah, when you get to white and blue, we, we call the emergency people. Yeah, it's, it's Spinal Tap. It's, uh, you can <laughs> see the blue in the veins. It's a graphic start to the yeah. Total Soccer Show. Um, so if you missed our um, MLS roundup, which mm-hmm. is essentially what it was, um, that show was on... Uh, it was earlier on Monday, yeah. so go back in the iTunes feed and you will find it. Today we are talking about U.S. nationals yep. um, in many different ways. Yeah. We're going to round up some U.S. men's national team action in the Bundesliga. There were goals for Pulisic and Johnson mm-hmm. um, for different teams. Yep. Uh, we are going to talk U.S. women's national team in that game against England. It looks bad on paper, it looked better on grass. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the... U.S. under-20s and their win in the CONCACAF U-20 championship game. Yes, sir. Grand final. Grand, Grand final. final. I believe yep. it was called. El Grand final. Shall we start in the Bundesliga with Christian Pulisic? Let's do it. His Borussia Dortmund team beat Javier Hernandez mm-hmm. by Leverkusen 6-2. Um, Pulisic only got a half but did get a goal and an assist. So we finally got some more numbers on the board Mm -hmm. for Christian Pulisic because this has been something of a mounting criticism, right? Yeah, basically that he consistently plays, consistently gets minutes, but hasn't really found his name on the score sheet, hasn't Mm -hmm. really contributed that much by way of assists. And one thing that you and I have realized is that that tends to be because he's, regardless of the formation, played out wide. That he's clearly tasked by Thomas Tuchel with keeping wide, stretching the field, making defenses come to him, and opening up opportunities for his teammates. Because Dortmund do that on Mm -hmm. both sides. This is very much a Tuchel trademark, um, that you have one Guy, trademark. One guy on one touchline, Dakar. one guy on the other touchline, and really spread that team out because they're a possession team and they're passing mm-hmm. from side to side trying to open people up. So essentially, I, I claim that Pulisic is doing a job for Dortmund yeah. quite regularly. I think so, except that in this game what happened is Dortmund came out in some version of like a 3-4-3, 3-4-1-2, yeah. thereabouts. Yeah. Um, and whereas Pulisic would usually be playing on the outsides, uh, like outside of that, that midfield yeah. four, basically, in this situation it was... Royce. Thank you, Marco Royce goes out with injury. Yep. In comes Christian Pulisic before halftime in like the 44th minute or yeah, so, yeah. and he is now part of that front three that in that 3-4-2-1. And I he, want to imagine he's rubbing his hands and thinking, yes, this is finding my chance. Mm-hmm. And he should be, because it, it came off. It was his chance. And we got to see him far more involved in the attack, like on a consistent basis. Mm-hmm. He was switching with Usman Dembele when they were both involved, uh, kind of switching from right to left and back and forth, yeah, yeah. playing in the middle, transitioning into attack and defense. And it was all very impressive, I would say, overall. And there's still some mm-hmm. defensive work as well. We oh, saw yeah. Pulisic, um, I think he either lost the ball or got beat, he, chased back half the length of the field. He tri- Basically, he tried to like do the high press, and he didn't close down the angle tight enough, so they were able to pass it by him. And you see him turn realize like oh no and then he sprints yeah. 30 yards Tuchel doesn't like it yeah. when we don't get this I'm going to go make up for it and forces the turnover yes, so I mean I mean, and I think that's probably the reason why Thomas Tuchel has come to rely upon Christian Pulisic mm-hmm. is because you're going to get that effort out of him and he's going to make it count every single time including when he scores goals yes so obviously the highlight most people yep. will know from this game is the Christian Pulisic goal mm-hmm. really nice goal but also really nice build it play mm-hmm. it basically starts with Pulisic sort of in a more central spot he's almost in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to call it zone 14, that like attacking midfield spot just Thereabouts. outside mm-hmm. the area. Um, he's got the ball under his feet. He's got three players coming towards him. Mm-hmm. It looks bad. Yep. But then he manages to find a way. I'm not even sure how he finds a way out of um, all that sort of enclosed space. He's so he, not claustrophobic. I'll yeah, basically, <laughs> he li- he lifts it over for, uh, I believe it's Durham who's running ba- past. Yeah. Uh, and then he continues his run after Durham. But it's impressive because he has, as you said, he has three defenders on him, he being Pulisic. And he's able to very calmly keep the ball under control and wait. And then, like I said, like not ne- I don't think he necessarily drags it back to do it, but he creates enough room that he can and then he lift it. it away from yeah, God. he can then lift it over those two defenders. So he basically bypasses three defenders at mm-hmm. once, which is very impressive. But then doesn't just sit there and watch. He gets to running. Yeah, as soon as he puts it out mm-hmm. wide to Dorm. And it just reminded me that Pulisic is Croatian, right? It's right. pronounced Pulisic in mm-hmm. Croatia. It was kind of Modric-y, the yeah. way he was so calm under pressure from three defenders Absolutely. and found the pass. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as you said, yeah, he lifts it out wide to Dorm, doing what is usually the Pulisic role, yep. out wide, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then makes a really smart sort of fast darting run mm-hmm. to roughly the near post. Right. Mm-hmm. And I th- I'm not sure if the ball, the reverse ball from Durham is for Pulisic or if it's for somebody else because there's a number of yes. uh, Dortmund attackers 
in there, but it's Pulisic who has the full momentum, uh-huh. gets the left foot to it, and it's a really nice kind of opens up his hips, left foot, side foots it into the far post. Mm-hmm. Goalkeeper has no chance. Doesn't he sort of take it in a weird stride as well? Yeah. Because every time I see it, I think he's going to hit it with his right, but then he catches it on the bounce with his open left foot. It's, yeah, it's essentially like his momentum. Like He doesn't really strike the ball it's more like his momentum he kind of locks his ankle and as he's running mm-hmm. it's just his natural momentum follow through carries the ball into the goal like, it that, it's really well done is it that smart thing where um, I'm not very good at this I feel like mm-hmm. you're better at this um, when the ball is going fast you kind of know that all you've got to do is mm-hmm. redirect Direct it, it yep. slightly. there's no need to hit it hard right? Yep. Yeah. And he that's doesn't. me that's over the bar mm-hmm. and into the yellow wall yeah, and, and, and not to be <laughs> – me too. Don't worry about that. But And not to be, like, too congratulatory, like, too overblown about Christian Pulisic. But it, that kind of, like, speaks to what he did in this game, that it's the ability to read the situation very quickly, adapt to it, and create something seemingly out of nothing. Because mm-hmm. in that situation, he's got three on him. Then it's kind of an awkward ball back in that he's able to put home. But then for the assist, it's really quick thinking to, to just take a touch and then a touch and square it for Guerrero, yeah. I believe. Yeah, it's Rafael Guerrero coming in from the left, yeah. Right, because, I mean, it's a, it's a loose ball. Is it Castro who I gets... I think it's Castro who has essentially lost the mm-hmm. ball when he should have had it. Yeah. But as soon as that ball is loose, Pulisic's on it yeah. fast and he's on it but he's it's that sort of like he's made the decision as soon as he touches the ball so yes. his first touch is a nice little one away from the pressure yep. and then it's an outside of the foot pass that sets up is that uh, Trevella? yeah it, mm, it's more like a push pass but in this situation yeah. it's a very well weighted like it's it's this is when it's okay, I would say, to use the outside of the foot because you know exactly what you're doing. Mm-hmm. To put it over on your left and then have to pass, pass it back takes too much time. Mm-hmm. It's just that little, like, dick, dick. Like, yep. that's all it takes. And, that and, the, that's the yeah, noise ding, for ding, the score. Yep, and it's in. <laughs> if um, he mic'd up his feet, that's yeah. what it would do. But then I think you pointed out even, like, there are just a couple different moments where he – so he can do those types of like maneuvers, but then also he can just receive the ball, but like open up at the exact moment that he receives it, and mm-hmm. then play it quickly. It's all he's two involved, and three touches. He has basically what this is not a real thing that you mm-hmm. get awarded, but he has the MLS assist yeah, he does. on the Schurla penalty kick yeah. by doing exactly that. Yeah, again, he comes towards the middle, mm-hmm. and like you said, receives it, opens up, moves mm-hmm. the ball along, and and on we go. And then Schurla, uh, yeah. Actually, I don't know if it's Schiller that goes down, but it does result in a penalty kick that Schiller does score. I, I think it's Schiller who goes down. I think he wins it and takes it. Yeah, right? yeah that, that seems likely. I wasn't fully confident. Right, <laughs> I got so, your back, buddy. I got your back. So we're very impressed with this Pulisic mm-hmm. performance for a half and a bit, which yes. is essentially what it is. Mm-hmm. The big question for me is, not will Borussia Dortmund win the Bundesliga? Because yeah. we checked the table, they're third, but it's Bayern Munich to win, yes. to, to lose. It's yeah, Bayern yeah, Munich. Yeah, yeah. That should have ended with a period. There. Yeah, I know what you meant. I know what you meant. <laughs> Um, but the big game is this Wednesday. Mm-hmm. It's the second leg of the Champions League round of 16 game against Benfica. You are correct. Benfica are 1-0 up from the first leg. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second leg, Borussia Dortmund are at home. Right. It doesn't get much bigger, I want to say, in Dortmund's season. Does Christian Pulisic start? Uh, I think he does. I think he does because you do have the injuries that we've already talked about. We have Mario Goetze out uh, yes. for who knows how oh, long. So, yeah, we didn't say Royce is out for, we believe, around four weeks mm-hmm. with a hamstring injury. So Pulisic was the direct replacement in this mm-hmm. game. And Mario Goetze has, I actually can't remember what the name of it is, but he has like some really serious uh, serious illness, right? Some yeah. metabolism yeah. illness that causes his muscles to lose strength. Like, that's yeah. a serious thing. He's not going to be playing soccer for the foreseeable future, right. I believe. So I think given... The kind of lightness of numbers combined with what Pulisic did in this game, what yeah. he kind of consistently does. I wouldn't even be that surprised if he was being arrested for that game and then he had to come uh, on for this game because I think he is the kind of Champions League role player yeah. in a lot of ways. So he might not be one of those attacking three. He might be that outside kind of winger, like oh. defensive attacker in a 3 4 3. Maybe Durham was playing this game and Pulisic was going to play the next game. Who knows? Then but then we'll Benfica find game. out this week and I'm yeah. very excited to do so. So, um, yeah, unless um, Pulisic doesn't play or the game is a, like a really dull affair. Yeah. <laughs> the plan is that we're going to watch that this week. We're going like, to watch Benfica, yep. mm-hmm. Dortmund, and see if Dortmund can turn it around and get uh, Christian Pulisic into the quarterfinals mm-hmm. of the Champions League. I am down for that. A man who won't be in the Champions League quarterfinals, but did have two Bundesliga goals yeah, did. this weekend, is Fabian Johnson. Mm-hmm. So Fabian Johnson playing for Borussia Mönchengladbach against Schalke. Um, the score was 4-2 to mm-hmm. Mönchengladbach. Fabi got two. He got two goals from left midfield. And this actually makes me happier than Christian Pulisic. All right. Only because lately I've been checking Borussia Mönchengladbach's results, uh-huh. and it is pretty consistently, there have been some starts in there, but it's pretty consistently Fabian Johnson for 14 minutes, Fabian Johnson for 16 minutes. Mm-hmm. He seems like he has found his way to being a bench 
player mm-hmm. for Borussia Mönchengladbach. And so to see him start this game yep. and have the impact that he did yeah. and look as lively and energetic and as much of a goal threat as he did, yes. it's very exciting and reassuring. So what I saw was Borussia Mönchengladbach sitting back yep. in a 4-4-2. But Absolutely. then whenever Schalke would sort of lose possession, Borussia Mönchengladbach would go. Mm-hmm. Um, and this isn't exactly how the first goal comes about. There's a little bit of change of possession back and forth. Right? So it gets a bit crazy, mm-hmm. right? But Johnson does go. He does. So it's a ball that goes out wide. It's from Herman, right? Mm-hmm. Herman's ready to put the cross in. You spotted Fabian Johnson spots this before anybody and makes a run to a darting run. Darting's not even fast enough. What's faster than darting? Uh, lightning run? Rabbit darting. <laughs> rabbit darting. Yeah, yeah. Lightning ra- darting. <laughs> lightning rabbit darting. Yeah. A rabbit made of lightning. And it's run to yeah. the nip. And the back the back three for for Schalke is uh, Bad Stuber, Nastasic, and Havidus. I mean those are three names that we know. Those are three proven proven defenders in the uh-huh. Bundesliga. And to see Fabian Johnson just exploit them to the point where... I yeah, who's think, number four? I think it was H- Havidus as number four. I think he was the one... Oh, World Cup winner. You could, uh, see him, you could see him turn and scream at his other defenders because he had no idea that Fabian Johnson was streaking through. Mm-hmm. And I think he says the German equivalent of tell me or yeah. like let me know or something like that. And it's not like he didn't try because mm-hmm. I think... We, so we watched the slow motion replay. Mm-hmm. Um, as Johnson is making the darting lightning rabbit yep. run mm-hmm. to the near post, you see Havidus check both shoulders mm-hmm. he looks over both shoulders and neither time does he see Fabian Johnson because that's how quick Fabian Johnson was <laughs> that basically in the time that he looks like right when he should be looking left mm-hmm. Fabian Johnson has moved yep. and then when he looks left Fabian Johnson has already gone from that space objects in your re- rear view mm-hmm. mirror may be faster than they appear yep and, and again <laughs> this is an example of when you're moving that fast the most important thing is just to get some body part onto this onto the ball because that's that ball a, comes in. That's a generous way of describing what well, Fabian Johnson does. That's what I'm saying. Well, I I mean, I, we can't say if it was the instep, his left instep, his left calf, his left knee. Either I way, like just above his kneecap. Yeah, he yeah. gets some he part of his meniscus. left leg. I think he gets his meniscus to it. Deal. I like it. <laughs> uh, it's about time meniscus has started doing something good other than tearing. <laughs> yeah. So why not? His his left meniscus scored. <laughs> But all credit to Fabio mm. Johnson for basically spotting that run and going for it. Absolutely. And making it happen. And just to um to give you to set the scene, mm-hmm. it was pouring rain. Oh yeah. Like, horrendously pouring rain. So horrendously it is, indeed. So it is the type of game mm-hmm. where you you're gonna score with your knee because everything's just crazy and the ball's bouncing around everywhere and no one's quite sure what's going mm-hmm. on. So the first goal, like maybe a fortuitous finish off of a very intelligent run. Uh-huh. The second goal a very well-taken finish off of a very well-done run. So it's Fabian Johnson scoring his mm-hmm. second goal, a 1-2 with Stindl. Mm-hmm. And I think 1-2 doesn't give it justice. It does not. Because, okay, this is from memory. Uh, he he receives, well, he runs onto a ball mm-hmm. and first time kind of back heel stops it. Really aggressive Stindl. back heel. <laughs> like, right? It's a full on like, ha! Huh. Yeah. Back heel. No, yeah. It's more like a chop, right? Because he yeah. doesn't like, hit it powerfully back heel yeah. and then Stindl has to control mm-hmm. it. It's more like he... It, no, that's it. It's in full stride, right? So yep. He's kind of sprinting and like chops it with the outside sort of back of his heel I think, into Stindl's direction. I think you're right. I think it's it's the full speed aspect of it that requires the like very powerful chop backwards because yeah. it like negates the fo- a lot of momentum in this show. Uh-huh. It negates the <laughs> the forward momentum with that like super strong backswing. Yeah. So that's why it basically just kills the ball. Then Fabian Johnson, to his credit, is able to keep his balance. A lot of core work being done there, I'm guessing. Continues They've his got one of those wobble chairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Continues his run. Shindle runs on, I think, takes a touch, and then outside of the foot, I think it was, threads the pass, splits two defenders. Fabian Johnson, while under pressure, kind of sizes up what's happening and really like shoots the ball, places the ball at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's a combination of the two. And he's kind of stumbling as he does yep. it, which makes this actually makes this a much mm-hmm. more impressive, controlled finish yeah. than the one that came off. He gets hit from behind as he shoots the ball. Mm-hmm. And and then the goalkeeper's follow through takes him out. <laughs> so he gets double hit there and ends up on the ground, but pops right back up to celebrate. My favorite thing about it all is that how mm-hmm. deliberate it is. Like yep. it's not a fancy back hill for nope. like for showiness's mm-hmm. sake. It's definitely like I know I know what I'm doing exactly. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna yeah. Chop and then go, and I'm going to be in on goal. And uh, Schalke are going to know nothing about yeah. it. Yeah, and it's <laughs> and it's especially surprising because that type of play you see in a person who's been playing regularly and starting regularly for the entire season because he knows where his teammates are. They've mm-hmm. done these type of things. They can kind of read each other off the ball. For a guy who's been coming in as a late game substitute and hasn't been getting as many minutes yeah. to be able to pull that off, it speaks to the confidence with which he was playing, at least in this game. All right, I don't want to get you overexcited, mm-hmm. but based on all the excitement we just talked about, yeah. when the US plays uh, Honduras mm-hmm. and Panama in World Cup qualifying, mm-hmm. Fabi on the left, Christian Pulisic on the right. I would like it. I would like it. I think, though, I think, though, 
if we're going to go like way overblown hype based on very minimal like uh, sample sizes. Let's do it. I mean, we talked about it on the MLS show. What has Darlington Nabby been doing really well for Portland? Oh. Starting on the left, coming inside, and inviting that kind of left flank run from the left fullback. Oh, okay. I wouldn't mind a Darlington Nabby, Fabian Johnson left side. Ooh. The two of them combining with Christian Pulisic on the right. I would also accept that. Mm-hmm. I would absolutely accept yep. that. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. We'll, we'll, know, we'll know more. Yep. That, that's the earliest USA Honduras preview you're going to hear, I think, <laughs> on, any, on any soccer <laughs> podcast in America. Probably. <laughs> All right. Later on today's show, mm-hmm. we are going to talk U.S. women's national team. That defeat to England that had some very interesting things going on in it. And we're also going to talk about the US under 20s. The men's team won the CONCACAF Championship down in Costa Rica against Honduras. This is true. But first, today's show is sponsored by Health IQ, our new sponsors, Health IQ. Health IQ wants to give financial rewards to health conscious people. That's right. Health IQ has partnered with major life insurance companies to get lower rates for people with healthy lifestyles. They've used science and data to fight for lower rates on life insurance for health conscious, for the health conscious, excuse me, including soccer players, runners, cyclists, weightlifters, swimmers, vegans and vegetarians, mm-hmm. and many more. So what Health IQ wants us to do is get mm-hmm. the message out to people who play soccer yep. to let you know that you lead a healthy lifestyle. Like mm-hmm. playing soccer is the equivalent of running many, many miles, um, especially if you do it like regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, and that this is one of the things that will qualify you for a lowered rate on life insurance. Health IQ does this where like um, regular life insurance companies will like find what's wrong with you and charge you more for it. Mm-hmm. Health IQ's job is to find what's right with you, take that to a life insurance company yep. and say, hey, this person should get a lower rate. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I thought we should maybe do is think about if you were going to get life insurance for any soccer player Mm -hmm. in the world, who, using Health IQ, would get the lowest – who deserves the lowest life insurance rate? So here's the thing. I thought I had a perfect answer. Now I realize I might not have a perfect answer. Why is that then? Because my answer is Latan Ibrahimovic. (laughs) Okay. so He looks good at 35. I'll give him that. Well, that's a big part of it, right? He's getting near the end of his career, though. So you don't have to worry about like, oh, he's 22. He's built on speed. He might blow his ACL out, and then he's done Uh forever. Worst things could happen. But he uh, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, doesn't go out anymore. Uh, Here are two of his quotes of his Instagram from when he's training. Uh, there's no need to get in shape because I stay in shape <laughs> and there is no free time there is hard work and objectives wow. <laughs> That's, that is Latan Ibrahimovic um, notoriously he was the first uh, into training at PSG the last to leave usually stayed to work on his free kicks yeah. and has a black belt in judo so he's always I challenging himself that. But so if that, he took the health mm-hmm. IQ sports quizzes, he could do soccer. And yep. He could do the uh, the like healthy lifestyle diet type thing. He could, there's probably a martial arts one he could take. Yeah. yeah. Here's the problem though: What's is that, that he's so competitive that when he retires, there is no way he's done competing, and so he is going to be like <laughs> the first soccer player in space or something. <laughs> something that he will push his limits to be like the first man to run up Mount Everest without stopping, or and then I could see things going south. So maybe he wouldn't be the best, but I think in his current condition, he's worth insuring. So I scoured the globe mm-hmm. looking for my sort of health conscious player who deserves. That's what you then. I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was fast. Right, I'm like Santa Claus. <laughs> um, and actually, this isn't my pick because I know it doesn't count. But the first guy that came to mind was Sir Stanley Matthews. Okay. So in the 1940s and 50s, mm-hmm. when soccer players were like kind of hard drinking in England and you know not very healthy, they were smoking mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, Stanley Matthews was teetotal, didn't mm. drink, um, and vegetarian. In the 50s in England, wow. in like a very working class men's game, All right. right? Yep. And if you if you recall, Sir Stanley Matthews played in the first division until he was 52 years old. I forgot about that. Yes. Ooh, that's a good shout. So if this podcast was set 60-something years ago, Stanley Matthews would definitely be my answer. Yeah, he, and, he and Zlatan could have an intensity off, I yes, bet. Yes, they certainly I feel could. like they take things seriously. I feel like Stanley could cross for Zlatan as well. That would be a, quite the combo. I'd enjoy if that. only that could happen. All right, but who's your nominee then, <laughs> since Stanley Matthews won't work? Um, a surprise vegetarian, especially given where he comes from, mm-hmm. Sergio Aguero. Wow. Yes. Is he really? Yep. And bear in mind, he is from Argentina, uh-huh. where um, steak mm-hmm. and uh, Malbec are both, yeah. <laughs> both very good and very yep. popular. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Sergio Aguero, the Man City striker, is a vegetarian, so he's my pick. Can I make another yeah. another point about Sergio Aguero? 
you you kind of want like the cautionary scared straight tale when, yeah. when, so that you kind of keep your kid on the straight and narrow, right? <laughs> yeah. That's why they have the scared straight program. And like you want maybe your player <laughs> to have where you're an influence <laughs> in his life that has like made all the wrong decisions yes. and maybe then they won't follow through. Mm-hmm. And I believe Sergio Aguero's father-in-law is Diego Maradona. Uh, yeah, I, I'm <laughs> so, certain that he So is. I feel like he would just listen to Diego's stories and then be like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so I do know from my research, Health IQ definitely want to like uh, – Make, make this open to as many people as possible. Yeah. Find the good points in people's mm-hmm. lives. I think even though Diego Maradona has definitely played a lot of soccer in his yep. life, I don't think he would qualify. No. <laughs> given some of his past choices. Yeah. He's the anti-example. But you're right. He will scare straight. Sergio Aguero, yep. a vegetarian. I'm sure he's in super duper shape. Yep. Uh, Manchester City and Argentina striker. I love it. And if you want to see if you could qualify as well, you go to healthiq.com slash TSS. The link is in the show notes. You can take the quiz and get a quote. And to, uh, to underline the idea of the quizzes, Mm-hmm. These are sort of um, health quizzes, so you can essentially gain points by proving that you know about healthy diet, that you know about like how to play soccer, that you know how to like run. Mm-hmm. Um, the more points you get, the more data Health IQ have on you. The lower the rate they can get you mm-hmm. when they present your information to life insurance companies. Mm-hmm. So once again, go to healthiq.com/tss. Again, the link in the show notes uh, to take the quiz and get a quote. Thank you again to Health IQ for sponsoring the Total Soccer Show. So, US Women's National Team lost 1-0 to England in the second game of the She Believes Cup. And weirdly, even though they lost, mm-hmm. I don't feel bad about it, and not just because I'm English. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that, about how much your rooting, rooting loyalties had to play here. It's mo- I am mostly just feeling the US. I think just because, again, I said this before, I just know this team. I've been on a journey with this right. team in a way that I haven't with the, mm-hmm. the England women's team. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... Do you, first of all, do you agree with me that even though they lost to England, the US women, it was actually sort of a good performance? Uh, and if so, what? let's start with a positive. Like, what did you enjoy? About yeah, it? I mean, I think you can lose and play well in any game. I think the difference yeah. here is that it's the US women, you know, reigning world, world champions. We expect you them to win the all the time. Yeah, and so there comes this idea that, yeah, if you play... The only way they could possibly lose is if they played poorly. Is if there was some disaster, right? Yeah, and I don't think that they played the best game I've ever seen them play either. Uh, I mean, it, you have to keep in mind that it's an experimental roster and it's, it's an experimental formation with that three, four, one, two. So, yeah. I mean, with that in mind, there's definitely some things that they learned that were good. There were definitely some bad points as well. And if um, if you haven't seen this game, you mm-hmm. said there's a good chance someone listening to this hasn't seen this game. I would say the U.S. did not start with their strongest possible team. Um, or at least, at least, let's say they did not start with the same team that mm-hmm. beat Germany in the three four one two and got us all excited. I want to say there were like seven changes in there, uh, yeah. including uh, Alyssa Nair not starting in yes. goal, and then you had Harris, the, right? yeah, and then you basically had you know lots of different uh, two new defenders experimentation. Yeah, Julie Johnson back in, Ali Krieger yeah. starting at left center back, which was yeah. maybe not we, great. We will talk about that mm-hmm. later. <laughs> well, let's talk about some positives then. And I think yeah. my, the biggest positive for me was Rose Lavelle, yes, who, I, who I had not seen play at all until uh, this game. Uh, she looked right at home with the. Women's national team. To me, Rose Lavelle was a name, yep. as in she was the number one pick in the NWSL draft. Mm-hmm. Um, I know she's in the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network, mm-hmm. but that's really all I knew about her is that she was highly rated. Right. So to actually see her on the field and see what she's all about, mm-hmm. it was honestly, it was better than I could have hoped because I normally think, okay, you've got like a promising young player, number one draft pick. I expected like technically sound and sensible mm-hmm. I didn't expect crazy crazy skills we got some weird skills at of Rose Lavelle see actually I expect the, I expect something different I, I feel like a lot of times it's very young very fast and very dynamic yes attacker. Mallory Pewish and, right? yeah and I mean, it's not that she's slow uh-uh. but she's very technical she's very calm on the ball there are many times when we would see her get the ball on the touchline two English defenders coming at her and she'd evade one and make a smart pass to yep. keep the ball in play and just keep things moving she could do, she could tackle she was a tough yeah. tackler defensively much she could tougher mix it up. than she looked right yeah. she looked like someone you could push off the ball easily but mm-hmm. instead she was doing she was the pusher not the pushy yeah. yeah and then she had good good possession and then even when she shifted into the middle of the field later on in the game she looked fine there too yeah she got i don't i'm not sure exactly how long but she got maybe 20 minutes in essentially the carly lloyd role mm-hmm. which is the number 10 attacking midfield role in yeah. the three four one two right so I was pretty pleased with her overall, uh, and then I and then I really like the three four one two. I yes. think that's a good exciting, shape right? and formation for the United States. Yeah, and oddly, it's um, it's a way to get a lot of the US's attacking players right. on the field. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the best p- people in that position. Uh, in this formation is Crystal Dunn, mm-hmm. who's no, she's a forward, right? Crystal right. Dunn's a forward, as I understand it, but she's essentially playing. I don't want to call it right wing back because she doesn't have to do that much defending, yep. but it's like attacking right midfield, mm-hmm. and it seems like she is absolutely 
taken to that role. I think so, yeah. yeah. And up against a lot of competition, because the problem with this three four one two is now you've just still got too many players that you want to squeeze into it. Uh, yeah, but I think we maybe solved part of that with Rose Lavelle being there, because she seemed confident using that left foot, yeah. whereas other players maybe do not. Tobin, <laughs> Tobin Heath looking in your direction. This was your revelation of the night, right? That yeah. Tobin Heath does not use her left foot. No, and it, yeah, and like I don't want to go down that whole route of like what that means about her as a player yeah. or anything like that. Just that I, I somehow had never noticed before that she like a multiple times in this game she spun like a 360 so mm-hmm. that she didn't have to touch the ball with her left foot because yep. she was so uncomfortable doing that and there was a few times when she did like this weird outside of the foot push pass yeah. where it's not like she just like tapped it away but like she tried to pass it by like sho- like shoveling the ball almost uh-huh. and it was just very strange to see whereas Ro- Rose Lavelle seemed more than capable of using that left foot. Yeah, the only thing with Rose Lavelle, I didn't see her like sprinting up and down the wing. Or yeah. basically, I didn't see her being as fast as, mm-hmm. say, Crystal Dunn, who really gave the US this like yeah. really fast outlet, got down the sideline many, many times. Mm-hmm. And I, I, in my head, I like the idea mm-hmm. of two fast wingers. Yeah, again, this may be my dad's influence because mm-hmm. he's always on about that. But maybe I take the trade off of one fast winger and one sort of slower but more technical uh, player on the left. Yeah, I, I think I would definitely take that. And I would especially take that if that right winger were Crystal Dunn. Yeah, because I think she's our number one choice, right, after today? I asked you this halfway through the game. I think so. It's tough to say because there are, as you said, so many options on yeah. either side. But I think the thing that I enjoyed the most about her, aside from her work rate and her energy and her technical ability, mm-hmm. is that the time she does play the ball in, she's picking her head up. Mm-hmm. And that is such an underrated thing where, um, yeah. by, by comparison, Mallory Pugh, so consistently would just put her head down, try to get to the touchline and cross that ball, yeah. or try to force it through. Even the times that she did pick her head up and knew that the pass wasn't on, she kind of didn't know what else to do, so she still tried to play it into the box just mm-hmm. to see what would happen. And it felt like more often than not, Crystal Dunn was picking her head up, finding a player at the back post, finding a player at the top of the box, cutting back, dropping it back to the outside back or outside center back, as it were. Mm-hmm. So I, I really liked her decision making when she was on the ball. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, should we talk about maybe why, even though we're praising the US and mm-hmm. they did things well, and I think they also did a good job of kind of pressing England and yep. not letting England play at the back and winning the ball high. Um, why were they unable to score? That's the big question. Mm-hmm. I have a theory. I think we've kind of talked about it, what, but what's your theory? Well, no, what's your theory? you got a theory. My, my theory is that England were very compact. I think we called it a 4-1-3-2, where mm-hmm. they didn't really have wingers. They had a, just a lot yep. of uh, people in the mm-hmm. central midfield, uh, and they forced the US to go wide. Mm-hmm. And the US actually came close several times, right? Some good crystal dawn crosses, a mm-hmm. um, couple of balls in from the left, mm-hmm. but nothing that resulted in a goal. And then when you got later in the game, and it was Mallory Pugh getting down there, mm-hmm. and I want to say making, again, I really love watching her play because she's so explosive but poor final decisions a lot of wasted um, wasted opportunities to cut the ball back and we're instead we're just trying to like bang it into the six yard box and it just comes off England defenders legs right every because, time. because we had what uh, Alex Morgan and Mallory Pugh starting up top and yes. then like uh, midway through the second and a half thereabouts you have Lynn Williams and Kristen Press coming on. Uh, they both go up top, and then Some Mallory Pugh. Talent to yeah. from. And then Mallory Pugh drops to the outside. Yeah. And then at that point, it did feel like it was a lot of long balls up top, long yes. balls to the channels for those players to run onto. Mm-hmm. I want to liken the Mallory Pugh problem mm-hmm. to the Christian Pulisic problem we maybe noticed earlier mm-hmm. in his career. Yeah. Do you know we noticed he would get to the byline yep. and then just try and force it across? Mm-hmm. But I also want to say that maybe the Mallory Pugh problem is a little worse. Okay. And it may be that she's not. Maybe her learning curve is not as. Um, aggressively being pushed as Pulisic is because mm-hmm. Pulisic's got that Bundesliga yep. coaching. He's got Thomas Tuchel yelling at him all the time. Yeah, Mallory Pugh's in college. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is that is a big difference. And not to say that that means that she should go pro or she should, you yeah. know, abandon college right away. Uh-huh. But it, it, it does, I feel like, speak to the fact that she's probably playing on a level where she certainly has, you know, tough tough opponents and tough competition within mm-hmm. that team. But it still isn't maybe on the level of, say, Borussia Dortmund and Christian Pulisic. Right, and, and even not on the level, obviously, of U.S. women's yeah. national team, mm-hmm. where even though the U.S. is often the better team, um, even in a game like this, right, they're the mm-hmm. team that was more expected to have more of the ball, have more attacking chances, um, I feel like she's probably, chances are at mo- chances to get down the sideline mm-hmm. and put quality balls in are at more of a premium than maybe in college where Mallory Pugh is doing that mm-hmm. regular. Like, no one she's playing against is older than 22, right? So yep. no one's got the experience to, like, stop her necessarily, mm-hmm. and she'll eventually force something doing that. I feel bad, Chris criticizing a sort of 18 year old Mm -hmm. phenom and maybe I shouldn't be doing this at all but I I kind of am of the the opinion that if for the US women's national team to improve at least it would be better if Mallory Pugh went pro and sort of faced tougher Mm -hmm. challenges but at the same time I also know that college is a valuable experience so maybe maybe college is more valuable 
than improving the US women's national team. I genuinely believe that might be the case. All right. I'm hedging, my, bet. I'm hedging my bets here a little bit. So I hear. So I will just say, I think the, the other problem, as you said, was the US getting forced out wide. Mm-hmm. But I think you did have these moments when, and I really liked the midfield combination of uh, Haran, Lloyd, and Mewis. I yes. thought that was a strong, like, very... Mewis is a badass. Yeah, it's a very tenacious yeah. midfield. Carly Lloyd kicking people in the face yes. in yellow cards. Not deliberately, I don't think. I don't think so. No. She, she seemed a little, uh, a little aggressive in this game. She uh-huh. definitely had a few. I think she took a couple hard challenges very early on. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if she was going to look for retaliation as the game went on. I don't think the kick to the face was retaliation, but she definitely was up for this one. (laughs) Um, But I think what happened, though, is that as the United States got into England's like defensive third, that sort of focus on quick passing and good possession in the middle of the field and then spreading out wide but bringing it back into the middle went away. And it became either shooting from half chances mm-hmm. or playing the ball out wide and forcing cr- crosses or forcing corners. Or the low balls that didn't quite work out. Yeah, and yeah. so it just, it just didn't seem as cohesive uh, of an attack going forward. And that's where I think Jill Ellis will, I hope, sticks with the formation and just needs to continue to practice and experiment to find the right combination and yeah. to get everybody used to it. Before we move on, uh, we should talk about two things. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, the England goal. Yep. And maybe we'll talk about that last because it's kind of almost the last thing that happened in the game, right? Mm-hmm. The 89th minute. Uh, but you mentioned earlier the idea of Ali Krieger mm-hmm. playing in a back three as a left-sided centre-back mm-hmm. when she's essentially been an attacking, overlapping right-back right. for... I was going to say most of her career. I'm mm-hmm. going to say almost all her career. Yeah. And it didn't... It, there were pros and cons. Let's put it that way. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you could see the pros and cons pretty readily in a couple of different plays mm-hmm. when she would kind of drive forward with the ball, try to complete a pass, and either get dispossessed or force it right to an English player who would take it right back down the field. Yep. And then Ali Krieger would sprint back, make a smart defensive play, step across, win the ball back, <laughs> and then do the same thing. And the cycle repeats <laughs> yeah. itself. Yeah. yeah, and so I think it was... Defensively, she was sound, as she so often is. Because yeah, she's fast, because she's smart. We talked mm-hmm. the other day about Darlington Nagby um, fooled uh, Saeed yeah. of Minnesota by mm-hmm. just getting the other side of him so that all he could do was either trip him or fall over, but mm-hmm. like put his body between she him. She did the exact same thing in this game. Well, no, she was, the def- she was Saeed in this, but she, but she recovered. Yeah, but, but then she could recovered by stepping in front and doing the exact same thing oh, defensively. <laughs> like She then blocked off the England attacker, yeah. and I think either drew the foul or cut to the outside and then mm-hmm. played the ball up the line. But there were also m- multiple opportunities when she did get the ball and looked to play it wide because she was in that left center back playing it out on the left channel mm-hmm. that if she were left footed, that pass gets completed Easy, yeah. because she was trying to use her right foot. It went in a bounce. It was as simple as that, right? Because we know Ali Krieger can mm-hmm. complete passes, right? Mm-hmm. We know she's like, you know, she's one of the consummate yep. pros. But yeah, it's a right footed left center back mm-hmm. trying to play out of the back you run into problems. Yeah. And we, I, I don't know what her pass completion was, but I'll, I'll bet good money that it was not above 75%. No, I bet it was significantly lower. Yeah. And you could just see the discomfort because you can you can just tell that with players sometimes when they're not comfortable in the way they're like moving or what they're trying to do with the ball. Mm-hmm. They, there's just that awkward like kind of hesitation. And you yeah, would yeah. see that from Allie Krieger. And, and just the fact that she would... At least twice, I think three or four other, like three or four total times, she really did just put the ball out of bounds, and it mm-hmm. was a bad pass. There's another one where I think she didn't trust herself to play it up the line with her left foot, so she turned and played it back to uh, Ashlyn Harris, who then kicked it straight out of bounds, yep. and then they had some words. I think mm-hmm. Ali Krieger ended with like, "Okay, yeah, that was my fault." Yeah. So it just seemed like she maybe wasn't quite as comfortable playing that position. Again, further experimentation, get her used to it. Maybe she will be. And so this feels like the U.S. Women's National Team like classic problem. Mm-hmm. Like sadly, there's so much that's right about the Ali Krieger in the back three because yep. of the defense. Um, capabilities, especially mm-hmm. one-on-one, which is a big part of being in the back three. But right centre-back is where she needs to be at. And mm-hmm. the person there right now is Becky Sauerbrunn, and she is not giving up her spot. Right? No, I mean, she's, she's one of the few players that started both games. Yeah. So, yeah, she's, she's definitely just staying there. way too important, and for, very, and for very good reasons. Yeah, although maybe Becky Sauerbrunn comes to centre-back and doesn't try to do quite so much as Julie Johnston. Right. So, yeah, it was Ali Long in the Germany game. Mm-hmm. It was Julie Johnston at the centre yep. of the back three in this game. Um, a lot of impressive tackles. Yep. A lot of slide tackles, maybe mm-hmm. a little bit too showy, is partly my opinion. Um, my opinion on slide tackles is changing as I get older. Mm-hmm. I feel like um, maybe not so many is a better idea, mm-hmm. even with a high success rate like Julie Johnston. Yep. Um, I do also want to say, I think at least some of the blame for England's goal in the 89th minute is on Julie Johnston trying to do too much. I agree. Because uh, the ball comes in, essentially Julie Johnston goes to try to win the header. Tobin Heath has the positioning on that. Mm-hmm. Tobin Heath does actually win that header. But at the same time that she's heading it, she gets bumped into it by Julie yeah. Johnston. Which she's got is some why, JJ in her back, right? Yeah, which is why that headed, like, headed clearance, if you want to put it in quotation marks, goes maybe 15 yards? Yeah, maybe? It just clears the 18-yard mm-hmm. uh, box, right? And then it drops to yeah Lucy Bronze, who one-time volley Bang. smashes it 
off the crossbar, and then my, there's chaos in the box. Yeah, my first take was great save by Harris. Yeah, didn't get a hand she to didn't it. Touch it nope. did she? Yeah, it just hit the bar. And then there's chaos in the box, and it looks like I want to say it's Morgan Bryan. It is number six, has yeah. position to play it out, and she's probably going to play it out for a corner. Mm-hmm. But better to concede a corner than chaos in the box. Yep. But then as Morgan Bryan is moving towards that ball, Julie Johnson does the same thing. They collide. Neither one of them can make a, a clean play on the ball, and in comes Ellen White to kind of stab the ball home yep. as Becky Sauerbrunn tries to close. Uh-huh. But it's Julie Johnson trying to make a play on the ball that puts uh, Tobin Heath off bounds. Yep. Then it's Julie Johnson trying to correct that mistake and ends up knocking Morgan Bryan off the ball yeah. and then England get the goal. And again, I feel bad because she's the hero of 2015. Mm-hmm. Right? She's one of the heroes of 2015. Yeah. But it definitely is a case of she has that mentality of like, I will get there first to everything. No one is stopping me. And sometimes when you've got teammates around you, mm-hmm. there's a time when you trust Tobin Heath to win that header yeah. or you trust Morgan Bryan to get there first yeah because she's if they, especially if they've got they've got the step on you they've got the advantage don't impede them don't impede them but I think it's also worth noting here that I think England only had maybe four players in the box with uh, yeah. with bronze outside uh-huh. so I also think that the US was a little bit disorganized in terms of who needs to mark who because yeah. they just had so many numbers back that I think they had a bunch of people free. So were England just happy with the point maybe at that point? I That's think why so. they don't send so many players forward. I, yeah, yeah, that would be my guess because maybe I think it's four in the box, one taking it, one outside the box. It might be five in there. Mm-hmm. But either way, you have a ton of American players back in that box and I think because they don't all have responsibilities, they're trying to basically like 1v1 mark as opposed to zonally mark and yep. what that leads to is a bunch of players <laughs> saying... Marking? Yeah, well it leads to a bunch of players <laughs> And like, all right, I'll make a play on the ball. And when you have two players trying to clear the ball once, yep. it often leads to no players clearing the ball. That's true. That's mm-hmm. true. Okay, so despite the defeat, mm-hmm. the U.S. are still in with a chance of winning the She Believes Cup. Right. It is a four-team group stage, right. and it is just the group stage. That is the She Believes Cup, mm-hmm. right? Um, so uh, U.S. have won one, lost one. Mm-hmm. England um, are in a similar situation. Won one, drawn one. Won one, drawn one. Mm-hmm. So it gives them four points? No, I'm sorry. England, I'm looking at the wrong thing. England, same, same exact thing. They're on three points as well. Okay. France are on top of the table with four points. And that's, My who, mistake. that's who the U.S. plays mm-hmm. on Tuesday night, I believe. Yes. Seven o'clock Eastern, Fox Sports 1. It's mm-hmm. at RFK Stadium. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe there'll be some Fuji, um in the, <laughs> <laughs> in the tailgate. Um, so, yeah, basically, uh, the U.S. needs to beat France. Mm-hmm. And then we need to hope we be in the US. Is this, I was going to say, is this weird to say as an Englishman? Yeah, it is a little bit. We need to hope that the England women's team mm-hmm. um, either loses to Germany, ties with Germany, or beats Germany by fewer goals than, it, than the US beats Right, because France. the, right? the tiebreaker would be goal difference, exactly. Yeah. So if they both win, the United States wins and England wins, then they both have six points. Right now they're level on goal difference. Uh, England ahead because they've scored more goals than the United States. All right, when I do goal mouth, I'm going to try and explain this much more succinctly. All right. <laughs> but that game again is uh, Tuesday night, mm-hmm. 7 o'clock, US v France. Um, any um, major things you'd like to see in that game, it's been that it's suddenly a must win? I mean, nothing major. I think, as I said, just I want to stick with the same shape, roughly the same personnel that have worked so far, and yeah. I'd like to see a result. You want to see Rose Lavelle stick with that? Yeah, I think so. I don't know if we will, but I wouldn't mind it. Okay, all right. Shall we move on to talk about a US team that actually lifted silverware? This weekend, yeah. the U.S. men's national team under 20s beat Honduras 0-0 yep. on penalty kicks, <laughs> so 5-3, um, and lifted the U-20 CONCACAF uh, to- uh, championship mm-hmm. and also had already qualified for the U-20 World Cup. Success all around. Yes. In the yes. end. So, and to clarify, that's because uh, the top two teams automatically advanced. I guess the top four teams automatically advanced. So, so the Cup, United yeah. States were guaranteed a spot. Mm-hmm. This was just to see how good a spot it was going to be. Yeah, and actually, I was wondering, before we watched this game, so we mm-hmm. DVR'd it, um, how sort of amped everyone would be for it. Since mm-hmm. everybody's already going to the World Cup, right? Honduras and the U.S. both qualified for the World Cup. Mm-hmm. This was just for the CONCACAF trophy. They both really wanted it, it seemed like. Yeah, I mean, I think because nothing is guaranteed. You don't know. You, It's really tough to know how good the squads are going to be at mm-hmm. the U-20 World Cup, whereas here you have an opportunity to Silver get silverware. Wear. Or goldware, I guess it should be. I'm not be. sure what it was. It looked like a large chalice. <laughs> it did. Anyway. It, it did. looked like um, at the end of Raiders of the no, at the end of uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Mm-hmm. It looked like the cup you should not choose. Okay, <laughs> that was a little more ruby encrusted, but sure, yeah, sure. I'm with, I'm with you overall. Cups, one of the cups. It would definitely melt your face. I think that was also gold. So I think overall, <laughs> what we're saying here is that Daryl has bad movie references. I think is where we've landed. But either way, it was a cup that they lifted because yep. they won, and no one's face melted. Nope. So it was definitely the one they needed. This is true. <laughs> um, so it ended with. Um, I think you've also just crossed with Raiders of the Lost Ark, but whatever, it's fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, the guy's face melts in um, his whole body dissolves. Oh, you're Raiders right. Raiders is their you're face right. melt. You're right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh. All right, so um, it ended with more or less the same team, or at least the same shape that started the first game. Mm-hmm. Uh, no Sebastian Salcedo, right. but we did have the back four, and then Eric Palmer Brown in defensive midfield, and then Tyler Adams ahead. Yes, and it seems like that gamble seems to have worked yeah. out for Ted Ramos by starting Eric yep. Palmer Brown a center back at defensive midfield. Yep. At least that's what the organizers of this tournament felt, because Eric Palmer Brown won the golden ball. Yes, he did. Who yep. would have guessed that either before the tournament or after the first game? Not I. Yep. So, uh, again, Will Parchman, we did the preview with him. Mm-hmm. He was very hesitant about this idea yep. after seeing the US lose to Panama let's underline that they yep. lost 1-0 to Panama in that the first game Eric Palmer Brandt defensive midfield looked like the problem mm-hmm. because he wasn't contributing enough to the attack um, get to this game where Honduras is sitting back right mm-hmm. so to have a very defensive defensive midfielder you would think would not work out I saw nothing wrong with what EPB did in this game I want to say he's improved over the course of the tournament I think he's definitely improved I think you saw that in the 75th minute when he had that that crucial interception. Yes. Uh, I f- forget who had the turnover. Austin uh, Trusty. Thank you, Austin Trusty yeah. would come in for Justin uh, Glad. Justin yeah. Glad. Turns the ball over. Eric Palmer Brown closes a good 30 yards. Yeah. Makes a really timely tackle. It's in the box. It's at pace, so it could easily be a penalty. Instead, he sticks it out for a corner kick. Yeah. And that was probably Honduras' best chance, I would Definitely. say. Definitely. I mean, yeah. so to give you a picture of the game, if you haven't mm-hmm. seen this guy, so I know maybe a lot of people won't have had access to this. Yep. Honduras defended mostly the whole game. Oh. And I think just hoped to catch something on the counter. Yep. In the 75th minute, mm-hmm. this was the chance, right? Mm-hmm. Austin Trusty, maybe a little... Uh, I was going to say rusty, that's the wrong word. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, not, not quite warmed up enough. Uh, coughs it up. There's a break on. EPB comes, like you said, he, I don't know how many yards he mm-hmm. closes. But the key to me is he's at full pace and he suddenly like suddenly stops and slows up at exactly the right time mm-hmm. to not run into the striker, not run past the striker, but to stop in the striker's path and block the possible shot. Yeah, and so I think his like his decision-making there mm-hmm. is is impressive. But I think, as silly as it sounds, his decision-making is impressive and also his ability to make a decision is impressive. And those are those two are different, different things for things? me because in terms of how he evaluates closing down that angle, making the smart tackle, all of that is decision-making. But even the decision to go after that ball, if you watch that replay... It looks like he is a man amongst boys because he goes steamrolling yeah. through to get on the end of that, whereas you have the rest of the U.S. defense kind of retreating back into a defensive position. Yeah, yeah. And I think nobody really wants to be the one to overcommit. No one wants to be at a position. Everyone's a little bit nervous because it's all of a sudden this like turnover that they didn't yeah. expect to happen. It's like, oh, no, our worst nightmare. Yeah, and so no one, <laughs> is, kind of, no one is stepping <laughs> up. And instead, Eric Palmer Brown makes that decision to step up. And that's why I think he deserves extra credit. I would also argue that, um, say, I think Tommy Redding is the other Mm -hmm. centre-back who's kind of just watching it happen. But I think he has 100% faith in Eric Palmer Brown, which is part of why he's watching this happen. It's almost like it's the opposite of the Julie Johnson thing we're talking about, where he's thinking, all right, Eric's got this. I'm not going to step in the way. Eric's got this. I'm, I'm, not, do this I'm not sure I agree. I really? think this is what I'm talking about. Is I think he is not sure what to do. So he is re- retreating towards goal. He's got someone else to cover. I'm not even sure if he does. I think he just isn't sure what to do. So he gets uh-huh. back because he's like, I'm going to get in the middle. I'm going to hold my spot. And then if he comes inside, I'll be there ready. Or maybe Air if Palmer he goes Brown is, Jonathan Klinsman, I'll get it off the line. Yeah. yeah. And so Air, but Eric Palmer Brown is the one who like cuts diagonally between the two mm-hmm. and gets to the ball first. <laughs> so <laughs> that's right. what I'm saying. So a Total Soccer Show. Mm-hmm. We've already done the apology after yeah. he scored the winner against Mexico. Yeah. Total Soccer Show salute to Eric Palmer Brown, Mm -hmm. um, who could soon be playing for Sporting KC in Major League Soccer. I don't believe he would look out of place. No, I think he would probably be at center back. And I think a big part of that is that in that first game against Panama, it was basically Eric Palmer Brown at uh, defensive midfield, Tyler Adams as kind of the lone attacking midfielder, and that didn't work. But I think Mm -hmm. Tyler Ramos adjusted things a little bit, made it so that it wasn't just uh, Tyler Adams running around kind of having to <laughs> do everything himself. Yeah. It was much more of a combination between him and Luca De La Torre. Yeah. You had players coming had, inside. Actually, he had Eric Williamson alongside yeah. him to start, mm-hmm. and De La Torre uh, out on the left right. instead of mm-hmm. Sosedo. I think that's one of the things that uh, yep. really worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, Williamson came off quite early for Sabi, I believe. He did, and that's where I think Tab Ramos and this team get extra credit uh, because you had yeah you had Williamson coming off in like the 27th, 28th minute thereabouts, and then Justin Glad, as we said, coming off in like the 47th. Mm-hmm. So you've got to burn two substitutes like fairly early on in this game. Mm-hmm. And then you get one at the very end when he brings on Koi Craft for uh, Jeremy Abobasi, I think is what we're going with. Yep. Uh, that's at the very end. And we kind of quickly deduced that because there was no extra time, it was probably because Koi Craft is good at penalties. And when you see Koi Craft take that penalty kick for the United States... You understand why. It's, it's, a, it's a Louis van Gaal, Tim Krul decision, mm-hmm. right? It's absolutely the... Per- I mean, it's the other way around because it's an attacking player taking a PK, but yep. it's the perfect decision because Koi Craft's penalty kick was... Hard to read mm-hmm. and also 
semi unstoppable. Yes. Which is not a real thing. I guess the training unstoppable is called unstoppable. And spoiler alert, that's not what happens. <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're trying to redeem yourself with movies? Is that what's happening here? <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it was also impressive uh, from the United States, obviously winning the penalty shootout 5-4. to four. Mm-hmm. If you look at the way they took, I think they completely... Oh, you took notes. You took I did. Notes. I yeah. think they completely threw off Honduras' goalkeeper. Because mm-hmm. their first three penalties are all to the left. Mm-hmm. He guesses right... Well, he guesses incorrectly to the right side every single time. Yep. So then Brooks it's, then it, in the first it's one, to right? his Bang left, it. the penalties are going to his right. So yep. he dives to his left, right, every single time. Then he, the time he figures it out and dives uh, to his left, that's when Luca De La Torre puts it to his right. So I think he, <laughs> like, and basically, and then, uh, so yeah, it's left, left, left. So it's the shooter's left three times, then the shooter's right, then the shooter's left again for the final one from Danny Acosta. Yep. And the keeper dives wrong every single time. There's a close-up of his face after, yeah. I think, the mm-hmm. De La Torre one where he's just like, oh. Yeah, and I think and I think that was a little confusing. So the key point I'll say is that basically he never dove the right way. It was never <laughs> like he got a hand to it; he came close. Yep. It was he was thrown off completely. I think I think the United States could have taken three or four more and been just fine. And at a more basic level, I think every U.S. player that mm-hmm. stepped up looked very, very, very confident. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even yeah. even uh, Danilo Costa. There was a shot of him like. When it became clear, fifth penalty taker, he was going to have to step yep. up. He looked a little apprehensive. Mm. But when he actually did get to the line, he was all in for scoring the winning PK. Mm-hmm. And then I think the other interesting component of this penalty shootout is the fact that Honduras went to the shooter's right, uh, Jonathan Klinsman's left every single time. So by the fourth uh, take, when they do miss, Jonathan Klinsman has figured it out and he guesses correctly. Mm-hmm. So it seemed like maybe Honduras had been told, aim to that side, it will be okay, or they all just made that decision. But in contrast to what the United States were doing, I think Honduras kind of stuck with the pattern and Jonathan Klinsman was able to figure it out, even though he doesn't get a hand to it, even though he doesn't get the save. I feel like he, him guessing right and being a big guy maybe throws them off a little bit. And if you haven't seen it, it is uh, number 10, mm-hmm. Rembrandt Flores. Yeah. That's a very How can I hard, forget? Yeah. A hard name to forget. Yeah. Skies it, mm-hmm. right? Skies it up and over yep. and maybe a little bit wide mm-hmm. as well. Does Klinsman going that way have anything to do with it? Because Klinsman does lean the right way yeah. before Flores strikes it, but I don't know how much credit to give him. I don't know, because I mean they do cut away, so maybe he did stuff in between the, the cut and when the camera came back. But yeah, we, we did free stream it just to see if there was any sort of like guessing or pointing one way yeah, or something just to throw games. him off. But yeah. instead I think he had just made his decision. He wasn't he wasn't Messing around, but maybe he did mess around to the extent that the referee was a little bit confused. Yeah, so, right, Honduras missed one. Yeah. Uh, then Acosta steps up and takes the fifth penalty, yep. which seals it for the U.S. Right, because the United States went first, so that's five penalties yeah. made to Honduras' is three at that yeah. point. Yeah, Honduras have one more to take, but even if they score it, yep. it's only four. Yep. Um, the referee, as the U.S. is celebrating, Tab Ramos is already in pictures, yeah. so he's a lot faster than he looks. Yeah. <laughs> The, the referee saying, no, 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 they've still got one more to take. Yeah. And I think the credit goes to um, Acosta yeah. saying, no, that's five. And also Brooks Lennon screaming, yeah. that's Aco- five. Acosta just like kind of like, I think knowing he's right, but not yeah. needing to make a big deal, is like, no, no, that was five, like kind yeah. of at that volume. And then, yeah, you can hear Brooks Lennon on the mic from 40 yards away <laughs> screaming, <laughs> that's five, that's five. And we thought maybe the ref was going to book someone, but I think what he's actually doing was just mm-hmm. looking at his card yeah. where he'd written down who scored and who missed. Yep. And he did some quick mental arithmetic. Yep. Say quick, it's probably 30 seconds too late. And declares the US the CONCACAF under-20 champions. Man, so 2017 is the year of like confusing conclusions for awards then? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it was not quite as bad as the Oscars, but yeah. similarly a moment where everybody was like, we won, we won. Did we win? We, win, win. we did win, we did win. Yay, okay, now we can celebrate again. Is that what can Contributed to what felt like um, over-exuberant celebrations, or is that just because I'm looking at teenagers? I think it's because you're looking at teenagers. Yeah, yeah. who? I, think, I mean, who? I think probably, especially after that first game, where they probably got yelled at a little bit. They were probably yeah. not feeling very confident. There were some very negative podcasts from uh, Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. Well, I mean, rightfully so. It was a bad game. Yeah. That Panama game was a bad game. It was talked about as one of the worst U.S. youth performances yeah. of all time. Yeah. And so to come from that to winning this tournament, and then obviously qualifying for the U20 World Cup later mm-hmm. this year, I mean, it's it's a very exciting turnaround. I think justified celebrations. All right. We also mm-hmm. had um, two Total Soccer Show Scouting Network players in this game. So if you don't mind, we want to skip ahead to uh, give you the scouting reports on the two sure. guys who were involved. Uh, would you like to go first? Sure. First one comes from Lucas Miller, uh, Muller, excuse me, scouting uh, Danilo Danny Acosta, the 19-year-old American defender for RSL. Uh, the U.S. U-20s won the CONCACAF U-20 championship after a shootout against Honduras. I knew that. Mm-hmm. And Danny scored the winning penalty. I knew that also. Did you? Mm-hmm. Uh, overall, he had a good tournament, displayed solid positioning, okay, and showed lots of promise. I would say even when he didn't display mm-hmm. solid positioning, he displayed some solid makeup play for okay. his not-solid positioning. Agreed. <laughs> uh, Lucas asked 
Rail Salt Lake general manager Craig Weibel uh, at a town hall meeting oh, right. about where Acosta, TSS Networks got contact. There you go about where Acosta will play for RSL, and he uh, Weibel said he'll likely be playing as a left back since he is left footed and had experience with that role for the U.S. The outside back spots are uh, Real's position with the least depth, so he's likely to see at least some time this season. I've just realized there's a slightly circular logic going on here because mm. Tab Ramos said yep. that. Remember, there was the mystery left back at the start of the tournament. He's been training with RSL. He, yeah. yeah, he's been training there with his club, so therefore he'll play left back. And now his club is saying, well, he's played there with the US, so he's going to play left back. I, well, feel like the, I feel like there's collusion here between well, Real Salt Lake and the US national team. I think the key component is that he's, <laughs> he's a defender with a left foot. And yeah. so maybe he, RSL were like, oh, far between. He, could be, he could be a left back because he's got a left foot. And then they told Tab Ramos that, and Tab Ramos was like, well, I mean, they're trying him there, so I'll try him there. Collusion. I'm and then it collusion. went back. Um, I will say I, I'm more up on the idea of Danny Costa as a left back after seeing the entire tournament as opposed to just seeing the Panama game. What is the collusion that they're going for here then? The, what are they both, colluding to establish? That Tab Ramos and Real Salt Lake between them decided that Danny Acosta was going to be a left back okay. but neither of them wanted to go first. Okay. So Tab Ramos said Real Salt Lake are doing it mm-hmm. and then Real Salt Lake say the US under 20s are doing it and then all of a sudden Danny Acosta finds himself going to go ahead and write tw- this down. 20 year career at left back. He's the new Maldini. Is for the saying. next time you accuse me of uh, believing in weird conspiracies. <laughs> I'm just going to point this one out to you. Uh, other report, Mr. Grove? Comes from Jim Brosha, who's mm-hmm. scouting Jonathan Klinsman, the goalkeeper. Um, Jim says he didn't watch much of the US under 20s, but he did see that Klinsman was named the top keeper at the CONCACAF U20 Championship. He kept two clean sheets and allowed only three goals in the five matches he played. Hmm, interesting. I guess I don't know who else could be the yep. top keeper, mm-hmm. but I don't remember Klinsman having any like standout game. I, I do but, remember that kind yeah. of soft goal against Panama. Yeah, I mean it wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't necessarily his fault. I don't remember him having like any howlers. Yeah, and I don't remember true, him making true. any significant mistakes. And mm-hmm. he did pull off a good save here and there. Mm-hmm. Kept some clean sheets. Did won a penalty shootout. Took some balls out. Of the yeah. Air. yeah. So I think. Over, shootout, yeah. I think you know what? Yeah, when it comes down to it, if there's no obvious candidate, if there yeah. wasn't one candidate, like goalkeeper who saved like a million shots in one game, mm-hmm. then nobody stands out, and so it tends to go to the tournament winner. Fair enough. Yeah, that's fair enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say as well, it's. Even this isn't to take anything away from Klinsman genuinely. I just want to, this is like a tangential point um, that the US defense essentially was really, really good because only conceded what, two goals? The entire tournament, or never conceded more than one goal, at least three goals total. Never conceded more than one goal four in a goals, game. Four goals total. Really? Mm-hmm. Where, so what? One against Panama. Mm-hmm. One against Haiti. Yep. One against El Salvador. One against Saint Kitts. Oh, I forgot that, mm-hmm. that happened. But that wasn't Jonathan Klinsman, which is why he only played five games. Got it. But he got didn't it. concede that got goal. Got it. Mm-hmm. All right. So never conceded more than one goal in a youth tournament. Yeah. Pretty impressive. I know I'm like changing my numbers mm-hmm. here, but it's still an impressive point. Um, and I put that down to the way that Tab Ramos has the team playing, which mm-hmm. is kind of. Again, Again, the Eric Palmer Brown in front of the back four does work defensively. Yep. And it seems like the US learned to, or got better at, moving the ball quickly when in possession, mm-hmm. as they did against Honduras, and being kind of rapid on the counter, yep. right? which was the kind of the plan to begin with. Yeah, so well done to the US U20s. Yes. And, and it's a team that I, I will say I look forward to seeing in this coming World Cup. Oh, yeah, so, of course, yeah. Part of this is they qualify for the World mm-hmm. Cup. That is, what, late May? I believe, like, May yep. 20th to June 11th in Korea. It's mm-hmm. going to be in South Korea. Right. The draw for the tournament is, I read this earlier, I believe March 15th. Mm-hmm. We'll find out who the U.S. is playing at the U20 World Cup March 15th. Excited to see this team again? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Is that just because you're familiar with them or because of anything in particular that this team does? I think I'm excited because uh, by our calculations, it seems like a lot of these guys have chances to get considerable minutes uh, yeah, in Major League yes. Soccer this season or with their teams this season. Uh, and so I think you're going to see them develop more. In the case of RSL, you have four of these players playing at one club. So it seems like maybe you could establish even better relationships there. Yeah. And uh, and maybe that will help you in the long term. I'm not sure how much Sebastian Sosaida will play this year, but I'd mm-hmm. say whoever is currently occupying Justin Glad's position, Brooks Lennon's position, and uh, Danny Acosta's left back position, mm-hmm. they, sh- they should be working extra hard in training. Yep. They should show up early this week mm-hmm. for practice. I, as far as I understand, <laughs> he, was, he was in... In with a shout of starting, oh, really? but then I think, I forget who the other uh, option was, but he did not go to the U20 World Cup, so I think mm-hmm. he is more likely to get the starting spot right away, mm-hmm. but uh, Sosedo could still get some minutes here and there. Okay, so keep an eye on those guys this season and again in May. We have more Total Soccer Show Skater Network reports, Taylor, mm-hmm. to, uh, to share with our listeners. Would you like to go first? We have one, two, three, four, five reports to go. I will go first. Uh, first one comes from Carl Getz, scouting Zach Clough, the 21-year-old striker for Nottingham Forest, English striker for Nottingham Forest. Oh, yeah. 
Zach Clough played the role of super sub in Forest <laughs> 3-0 win over second place Brighton and Hove Albion on Saturday. Clough entered the game in the 58th minute and scored the opener just two minutes later. He added a second later courtesy of a stoppage time penalty. Bonus report from Carl, Eric Lehigh, went the full 90 and earned the praise of local Nottingham Post, who wrote, quote, Lehigh dealt with Anthony Knockert uh, super- superbly throughout, and when Liam Rosnior? Rosnior. Ooh. There you go. Uh, threatened to get in behind. He stuck to him like a rash. <laughs> Rating, 8 out of 10. That's end such quote. A, such a classic English paper thing. Mm-hmm. He stuck to him like a rash. The reason I know how to pronounce Liam Rosignol is yep. that his dad, Leroy Rosignol, was a player before ah. him. So that's a blast from the past. Alrighty. <laughs> Up next, uh, Keith Kalmbach is scouting Federico Swervi Verdi Valverde. Mm-hmm. Um, his actual name is Federico Valverde. Mm-hmm. The 18 year old Uruguayan attacking midfielder with Real Madrid Castilla. And here's fair warning for you, Daryl Grove. This one was placed here for a reason. Okay. Proceed. Swervy Verdi's Castilla side eked out a 3-1 win over uh, Sokuyamas. Uh, please let Daryl try his hand at pronouncing that. Just did. <laughs> Passed with flying colours. He didn't do much in that match, at least according to the match report Keith read. Mm. Looking at his form, I guess the best I can hope for are a lot of MLS assists and the occasional goal. Three goals, no assists so far this season in 11 starts and two sub appearances. Or maybe he'll get 30 assists by the end of the season, thereby prompting Zidane to have to start him next season. Boundless optimism. Mm-hmm. Next report comes from uh, Beth Jally, or Yally, forgive me, Beth, and Alex Barone scouting Killian Mbappe, Ooh. the 18 year old striker for AS Monaco. He, we heard of him last week, right? Mm, or we two sure weeks did. ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Killian has now scored at nine goals in his last nine matches. Last Wednesday, he scored on the road in Monaco's 4 to 3 win over Marseille in the Coupe de France. Uh, Coupe de France, I'm not sure what the pronunciation there would be because Coupe. I never took France. It's Coupe. French, or France, either one. On Sunday, he scored a first half brace with a nutmeg volley and a glancing header in a 4 0 home victory over Nantes uh, to preserve Monaco's three point lead over PSG at the top of League Um. Uh, most notably, writes Beth, there's been a coup in the Jolly Barone household. She will be sending in future Killian updates unless Alex regains control of, quote, our Killian scouting organization, end quote. <laughs> this is the power struggle going on there. It's, it's a game of Killians, I believe. <laughs> Can't you just join forces? That, I mean, that's, what, that's what they're going to have to it's do with Game of Thrones. It's too easy, Daryl Grove. <laughs> Ryan Marzak mm-hmm. is scouting Pione Sisto, the 22-year-old Danish right winger for Salta Vigo. Um, not the best of reports regarding Pione, says mm-hmm. Ryan. He started and played 77 minutes in a 2-2 draw with Espanyol on Wednesday, but was slopping in terms of his possession and passing stats. That was supposed to be sloppy. I miswrote that. Okay, well, mm-hmm. sloppy typing. Sure. <laughs> then on Sunday, he was a second-half sub as his Celta Vigo team lost 5-0 to Barcelona. Up next for Sisto is a Europa League round of 16 clash with FC Krasnodar, where Ryan hopes Pione will step up his game a bit so he doesn't have to slide down, so he doesn't start to slide down the pecking order. Mm-hmm. Final report comes from DJ Ringus, scouting Levi Garcia, the 19-year-old left winger for AZ Alkmaar uh, uh, from Trinidad and Tobago. Things have happened since <laughs> DJ's last report. Uh, Levi scored the lone goal for AZ in a 7-1 defeat to Lyon in the Europa League. They were eliminated 11-2 on aggregate. His goal was a nice blast from about 25 yards out into the bottom corner. He then started AZ's next, or AZ's next league match against PEC Zwolle uh, and provided an assist in a 1-1 draw. It was a very good assist. He basically stands up two defenders, gets around one uses yeah. physicality to hold him off squares the ball for the goal I have seen it it was good <laughs> um, he also featured for AZ as they defeated SC Kember in the KNVB Becker semifinals that means they will now play Vitesse in the final which as uh, DJ notes is a TSS scouting spectacular that oh final. yeah that's Chelsea's team mm-hmm. right? I mean not officially but you know Yep, yep. <laughs> and with all that in mind, DJ fully expects TNT coach Dennis Lawrence to call Levi out for the country's upcoming World Cup qualifiers against Mexico and Panama, both at home later this month. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big mm-hmm. qualifying round for Trinidad and Tobago. Tobago, they're in yep. the same spot as the United States, essentially, yep. meaning no points and need to get it going. Yep, yep, need yep. Need to get that going. Levi Garcia might be able to help them do just that. <laughs> a quick bonus scouting report from me. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw that Gedeon Zelalem got 14 minutes off the bench for Ve Ve Ve. In their nil-nil draw in the what was it called the uh, Esther Divisi, the second right. tier of Dutch football. I'm not heartened by that because, as we talked about, it's not necessarily that high of a standard. Um, Zellerlem should be starting at that level. Yeah, he should. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, okay, let's hope, fingers crossed, fingers crossed that that gets better. Let's do. If you would like to join the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network and support the Total Soccer Show, you go to totalsoccershow.com slash subscribe. Uh, when you're there, you will see all the options for how you can support the show. When you subscribe,
subscribe, we will send you an exciting young player to scout. If you have subscribed and have not received your player, please email us, contact us at put itchy feet in the subject line, and let us know that you are waiting for your player. Mm-hmm. The website again is totalsoccershow.com slash subscribe. The link is in the show notes. There we go. This brings us to the end of this double, fascinating, exciting double episode of the Total Soccer Show, Taylor. Um, quick announcement. We should let people know that on Thursday, March 23rd, mm-hmm. we will be hosting a live trivia show um, right here in Richmond at Penny Lane Pub, 5th and Franklin, downtown, 7 p.m. March 23rd. Mm-hmm. There will be soccer trivia. There will be a video segment. It will be exciting. And I believe this Thursday at 3 p.m., we're doing a Reddit AM. Yes, uh, we are. MLS.reddit.com if you want to attend that. I think that's where it will be hosted, although it might be in the AMA section. No, yeah. Oh, I don't know. So, yeah, we'll go with what okay. you said. Cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you have any questions for us, the idea mm-hmm. of an AMA is literally ask me anything, right? Yep. So, we will any weird question you've got for us, we will absolutely try and I, I wouldn't. It. Don't encourage it. That's fine, but also soccer is fine, too. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't need, you don't need to encourage weird questions. I've been researching my possible answers to horse-sized ducks and duck-sized mm-hmm. horses. And the answer that. is uh, one horse-sized duck. <laughs> Why is that, that right the answer? Because it's more noble. <laughs> like it's fairer. Yeah, you're fighting. Well, you're fighting like one giant creature. <laughs> I'm going to steal There's a whole bunch of tiny, tiny creatures. <laughs> it's no good. Okay, Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to talk to me and for finally settling that question. Yes, sir. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Listeners, thank you for listening. Um, we will be back on Wednesday with a new Total Soccer show.